but dryness can make you feel anxious. It's that frazzled feeling, the the fried and frazzled feeling. And two sips of this infusion, it's like the whole body just goes. <sighs> mm. Hello, and welcome to the Herbs with Rosalie podcast, a show exploring how herbs heal as medicine, as food, and through nature connection. I'm your host, Rosalie de la Forêt. I created this YouTube channel to share trusted herbal wisdom so that you can get the best results when relying on herbs for your health. I love offering up practical knowledge to help you dive deeper into the world of medicinal plants and seasonal living. Each episode of the Herbs with Rosalie podcast is shared on YouTube as well as your favorite podcast app. Transcripts and recipes for each episode can be found at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com or through the link in the video description. Also in the video description, you'll find other helpful resources. For example, to get my best herbal tips, as well as fun bonuses, be sure to sign up for my weekly herbal newsletter. Okay, grab your cup of tea and let's dive in. Hello, my friend. I'm excited to bring you a podcast episode that's a little bit different than normal. For this episode and the next episode, I'm in conversation with my bestie, Rebecca Altman. We're sharing some favorite herbs as well as concepts for nervous system regulation and building resilience. So if you're feeling overwhelmed, stressed, or simply that you wish you could run away from it all and just be on vacation 24-7, these episodes are for you. This first week, we're also hosting a free mini course to help you find more ease and calm in your life. This mini course is part tea party, some might even call it an herbal tea challenge, and part introspection to help you make some powerful shifts in your own life. This free mini course starts April 4th and it runs for seven days. It's short and succinct while also being really impactful. You can sign up at herbalminiadventure.com. Again, you can sign up completely free at herbalminiadventure.com or you can use the link in the show notes. For those of you who don't already know her, Rebecca Altman loves connecting people to the earth, to plants, to each other, and to themselves. The underlying purpose behind all of her work is to help people remember the feeling of living in alignment with who they truly are and the larger flow of the universe. She has an online school called Wonder Botanica, where she teaches people how to connect to the earth, the heart path, and the universe, and works with clients individually to connect them with their own inner guidance. Rebecca lives in the mountains of Southern California with her dog and about a million oak trees. And despite so many reasons not to be, she remains steadfastly hopeful about human beings and this incredible planet. Find her at wonderbotanica.com. Welcome to the show, Rebecca. Thank you, Rosalie. I'm so happy to be here. Oh, well, you know, it's so fun. So yeah, it's fun to say your full name. And <laughs> I think we should first mention for those of you watching on YouTube, we've got some lovely lighting on Rebecca. Where are you? <laughs> I am in Berlin. So yeah. it is first thing in the morning for you and evening for me. And I am actually perched up against the window trying to catch as much of the fading light as I can. Well, you look lovely as always. Thank yeah. you, my love. Well, what a great time to talk about building resilience when someone's traveling, I think, um, because that can be a test of resilience. And um, gosh, I'm just so excited that we're like opening up building resilience again, because I've been going through a very busy time in my life and, you know, just using the skill set and just so grateful to have them. So let's just dive in. Bex, like, why are we doing, why are we doing this? <laughs> We, oh my goodness. I mean, I, I I think it's important to sort of look back and, and mention why we created this course in the first place, because it was actually a few years ago at a completely different time in both of our lives when I, I feel like we, for the majority of our friendship up until that point, I, I think that resilience was one of our most commonly talked about topics we just never called it resilience mm -hmm. we we talked about being exhausted we talked about the the lives that we 
the lives that we wanted to build that we didn't feel like we had the energy for. We talked about how like Monday morning often just felt like, oh goodness, like here I am again. Why can't it feel like Sunday today? Or, you know, I got back from a vacation and I felt so amazing and now I'm back in my life. And it was like all of these these topics, but we didn't know that it was resilience that we were talking about we were just like I don't want to be so exhausted I want more energy I want to feel really good I you know want to feel more capable and and I remember when I mean it's like I feel like for anyone the last few years after from 2020 until whatever year it is now it's just been this big blur um so I can't even remember what year it was (laughs) which is on brand um but I remember that we we both had this conversation where we were like, wait a minute, do you remember that we used to feel this way? And now we don't. And and then we just like our the the tone of our conversation started really changing and started becoming so much more about positive things and how much we loved our lives and like sort of like wins that we were having. Mm-hmm. Um and and th- and that was the I think the impetus for us writing it, because we were like, wait, we have come a really long way together as a as a result of all of the things that we've tried in our friendship because we just constantly be testing out tools with ourselves and with each other and like it 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 was just this very organic thing that emerged over the course of what the I don't know 12 how many years have we been friends it's been a long time a long time yeah that's I'm glad we have the same like um creation story remembering because that's basically what I remember too I remember we were just really stressed and I think we had an awareness that we were often talking about how stressed we were to each other and I think you and I like we often joke that we're like opposite twinsies so like we're Uh kind of like maybe that'll come out more but um but one thing that we are like we're just so similar about is we're both solutions oriented and so yeah we were like I'm stressed I'm overwhelmed I'm exhausted at the end of the week um And uh, like after time, we were just like, oh, well, I think both of us wanted to move beyond that. We didn't want to stay stuck in it. And so we both started trying different things, same things, sharing those things. And yeah, and it brought us to a different place. And we also have a lot of the same annoyances. Like there's um, (laughs) like there's a lot of talk about like productivity hacks and like here's how to like be more effective or, you know, move. I don't know, be more efficient so that you're less stressed. And mm-hmm. I, I'm not going to say that there's like never been a productivity hack that I, you know, didn't love. Like, sure. But when that becomes like such a huge focus, like the goal isn't to do more and more and more. I mean, that kind of just ends us up in the same spot. And then likewise, okay. even with herbs, you love herbs. I love herbs. And I feel that herbs are most powerful when we combine them with other tools in this sense. So I, I think there is a lot of, it's easy to misconstrue that like, oh, take this herb or that herb and suddenly right. you won't be overwhelmed. It'll change everything for you, <laughs> which I wish. <laughs> that would be great. Right? It would, it'd be, that, would, that would be the, the best option would be to just get to take one thing and never actually have to change. <laughs> right? Yeah, the ma- magic wand. The herbal magic the ma- wand. Magic wand. Yes, yeah. completely. It, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's really funny. And I think it like that, that brings up the the really good point about this whole resilience thing altogether, which is that it's actually about your relationship to your life and the relationship to all of the stuff you have going on. So if you're just doing productivity hacks so that you can pile more on, or if you're just like guzzling ashwagandha, you're doing like keg stands, but it's ashwagandha, (laughs) Uh, then, you know, you will have more, energy so that you can pile more on your plate but that doesn't actually change the relationship you have to whatever you have going on so it's you're still viewing life and everything in your life as this stressful thing um just that you're like able to do more stressful things but that's not actually what resilience is about like when Mm -hmm. I think we were just discussing this last week but when you're resilient you don't even fully know or need to think of yourself as resilient unless you've been in the place of being the opposite so so that you can then say oh i'm resilient and i am so grateful 
and appreciative of being resilient. But if you're not, I mean, if you are resilient, then you don't necessarily think of yourself as resilient. You're just like moving through life, handling stuff, doing things, being a capable human. And it doesn't occur to you that you're resilient because it, it, it's just not, not something that comes up. You're just living. And I think that that is the, the thing that changes when you change your relationship to your life, which is everything that we talk about in building resilience. It's not just about taking taking the stuff or doing the hacks. It's about actually creating internal changes that make your life and your relationship to it this like full of ease, joyful, fun thing that you can dance through. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that. Mm-hmm. It makes me think of Xavier, my handsome French husband, who is one of the most resilient people I know who would probably never describe himself as such because it's just kind of this inherent trait um, that he has not uh, really outwardly strove for. Whereas like, I've like really had to work on it. Like I've gone from a place of stress and overwhelm and feeling, you know, like the world on top of my shoulders 24 seven to like freeing myself of that. So I definitely have that like perspective, which is the whole wounded healer thing, right? Like you generally want to yeah. learn from somebody who's been through it, right? Who's been through it. Yeah, there's no, I, was just, I was just talking to somebody about that this afternoon where um, we're like, we're talking about, I, I think she was asking me like, but it's, it's such a shame that we have to go through struggles in life. And I was like, no, it's not. Like, not if you consider yourself a teacher, then you have nothing to teach if you've never actually struggled with it like if, if, if neither of us had ever experienced the opposite of resilience then we'd be like welcome to our course building resilience just do it just do it yeah just do the thing yeah what do you mean you need help just do it because <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing to teach so right yes and so this week april 4th through april 10th we are doing a building resilience mini course which is entirely free so much fun we've done this twice before and it's just been like it's been a highlight really um so yeah we're excited to do that and we'll talk more about that a bit later and you can easily sign up for this free event at herbalminiadventure.com fun url herbalminiadventure.com And we're going to have a whole week of introspection, of of transformation, and of course, herbs. And so we thought with this podcast, we would talk about some of the herbs that we're going to be um, encouraging people to explore during the week. And the first one we're going to talk about, I'm super excited for. It's never been on the podcast before. And it's one that Rebecca loves. Uh, Shatavri. This is asparagus racemosus, which it is kind of fun to think this is an asparagus plant. But yeah, it's one that I think people who love it would call it underrated. And I was looking at research for Shatavri and I actually found a researcher who said that. Well, he said it was understudied, but we can call that underrated, right? So I think Rebecca, it's underrated. Totally underrated. At least in Western herbalism, right? In other traditions yeah, like of Ayurveda, course. it's renowned. It's- but in Western yeah. herbalism, a little bit underrated. And tell me, tell me why you love it, Rebecca. I'm just <laughs> taking a moment to fawn over shatavari. I think the reason I love shatavari is, I mean, there's so many, but the main one is that if you think about how, and I'm about to throw out another herb, but I think, I think most people know about ashwagandha as a herb that is used to you know help give you more energy increase your resilience overall spoiler alert we will be talking about it too (laughs) um but i think it is ashwagandha is i mean almost every time i go to you know buy a formula or a protein powder or something there's ashwagandha in everything now and it is, um, so yeah, I think it's pretty well known and it's like, it helps to give that sort of a more of a, like a fiery <clears throat> energy. I, sorry about my, uh, my descriptions here, but <clears throat> it's what I've got. <laughs> and, uh, and it's like a more of a like forceful driving energy. And that is, I think, easier for us to get our minds around because there's a lot of stuff we want to get done that we need that like for um 
But Shatavari is the opposite and still really like builds resources and builds vitality and builds resilience. It's just not fiery forwards momentum energy. It is like the the deep subtle reserves and I think that that in itself is an underrated aspect of our being. And it's it's a bit frustrating because we don't really have terms in the West for these energies. If we were doing Chinese medicine, we could say yang energy and yin energy. Um, but we don't really have I, mean, I was just thinking terms. that that's how I think of Shatavari is like the yin to ashwagandha's yang. Um, but if people yeah. aren't familiar with that, that might be confusing. But it no, is this like you're... moisture, like it's like the moistness. Like I think of it as like dew in the morning, you know, going outside yes. and dew in the morning. That's like it's building that kind of reserve in you um, through this very, try not to say moistening again, <laughs> but this like, <laughs> you're like what's building the people moistening. Hate the most? <laughs> But it does like, and it actually does that, like you can think of that like esoterically, but it actually is like a galactagogue and builds breast milk. So it has like, you know, it really is that in the body though. It's building up. So you think of like people who are like burnt out, fried, crispy. Um, that is, you know, we're going to start thinking about shatavri for that, right? Shatavri. And there's that thing that happens that's like when you, you say burnt out, fried, crispy. And I think that like we can, easily think about that when it comes to the the nervous system and how we start to just feel crispy and like you look at me wrong and you know emotions happen <laughs> um but there's also the thing that happens especially as one ages where our tissues become less supple and less juicy for lack of better word and like we start to feel crispy or or like a like a like a raisin or something like it's just like everything starts to feel dry and withered a little bit um especially living in the mountain west as both of us do and shatavari it it just it it plumps it it brings moisture back to the mucous membranes it brings moisture back to all of the tissues of the body in a way that is really noticeable like it's it's not not like marshmallow if you take it you know within five minutes all of a sudden your eyeballs feel better it's more like you you take it for a week and then all of a sudden you notice in retrospect like oh like i didn't have a nosebleed yesterday or my this the skin on my hands isn't as dry or like my mucous membranes aren't aren't as dried out or the the thing that i noticed the first time I started taking it um, was three weeks later, I noticed that I had just been through the entire day of whatever the to-do lists were that I was doing. And this was back in the deeply non-resilient days of my life. And I noticed that, oh my goodness, I've been through my entire day and I'm not completely exhausted. Like I used to end my day at 0.5% hmm. battery. And it, and I just remember being like, oh, I'm at 15. <laughs> like, <laughs> it, yeah, it was, a, it, yeah, that kind of thing where you just, you're able to manage more, but it's not, uh, not an in your face type thing. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not mm -hmm. stimulating, but it is this wonderful adaptogen. It builds vitality overall builds vitality over time. Um, I do not, like, sometimes people say that shatavri is a women's herb, and of course, we don't really think of it like that. Um, but I will say it's very high in phytoestrogens, which can be very important for the female sex. And I, I was, again, looking at research today, and I found this cool study that was just published in 2024 that was looking at shatavri for postmenopausal women and showing that it helped... Um, 
revitalize their muscles, like as they were doing training and stuff, which I'm really into fitness and strength training as are you, I know, Rebecca. So I just thought that was a cool study of like, what an interesting thing for researchers to look at. So I feel like um, it's can be potentially beneficial for anybody dealing with dryness, dealing with burnout, feelings of being depleted, anybody, all genders. And it is interesting to see that like, it also specifically has a great, you know, pre-menopause, breastfeeding, uh, perimenopause, postmenopause, there's a lot of benefits because it is this, you know, overall building, uh, supporting herb that really just, as we said, doesn't get the attention that it should it until doesn't. now. Until now. You know, in Ayurveda, it is um, one of the things that is described as doing is increasing love and devotion. Mm. And I was thinking about that because, it, you know, if any of you like me tried love spells as a teenager, and we're unsuccessful for like whatever reason Chris Hemsworth still isn't here (laughs) (laughs) um you can't actually increase love and devotion I mean I don't think but the thing I was sort of marveling at is that what does if you're in a relationship what does actually increase love and devotion is feeling resourced is feeling like you have support and I'm feeling like you're not, you know, completely frazzled and run and out of time and have too much to do and like all of those things. But if you actually feel resourced, then of course you're able to feel more love and devotion. Mm-hmm. And um, so I thought that was kind of amazing. Yeah. That's about it. Yeah. Yeah. So again, I do want to emphasize that when I keep saying that Shatavari isn't well known. It really is in the Western world that I mean that because it is, it's been used for millennia in Ayurveda traditions and is highly revered. Um, highly. So, highly. Yeah. Um, and we're going to share a recipe with using Shatavari in just a bit, but I thought we should talk just a little bit about contraindications or not contraindications, maybe like considerations. Cause uh, you know, Rebecca and I are very different uh you often love little bits of things and herbs and you're sensitive and that's what works for you i like lots of herbs and so i'll use a ton of herbs and so and i'm often telling people like for those of you taking classes with me you'll know that i'm often like are you taking enough like i think people often don't take enough um but the thing with shatavri is you got to be careful with how much you take you do not want to take a whole bunch quickly so you want to start with a low dose start with a gram and just see how that feels Start with two grams, see how that feels. Maybe take two grams for a week and see how you feel. Uh, When you start getting up to like five or six grams, people can easily have feelings of like being bloated or just other kind of digestive things that aren't great. So if you are taking shatavari and you're increasing your doses and you're like, oh, my digestion's off, like then you just back up a little bit. Uh, what I don't want to see is people be like, oh, shatavari is my herb. It's everything that I need. And you like put a you know third of a cup into your tea and then you're like have a bad reaction. You're like, oh, it's not my herb. But it's a very sensitive one for dose. So it's more, it's kind of cool about that, about shatavari, because I think that's part of shatavari's lessons too. Like it's not like more is not better, you know, it's like this very that's like so subtle true. building. So and it'll, it'll remind you of that. So, you know, we'll share that recipe in just a bit. Is there anything um, I will also else you'd like to share? point out in terms of contraindications, a close friend of mine who's an Ayurvedic practitioner told me that it can increase breast tenderness or fibrocystic hmm. um, breast things. So it's just something to keep a lookout for. I, uh, I tend to be very estrogen dominant and I personally don't have that reaction to it, but um, it's something that I, uh, I know to look out for. Thank you for that. Well, should we go on to our next herb? Or do you have anything else to add? Next herb? All right. Next one. Um, next one. Because how could we not talk about oats? Oats. And it's, it's in, there's a lot of overlap with oats and shatavri. I would also say indication for milky oats specifically would be that like yeah. fried, burnt out, crispy person. Crispy. And we are going to share that recipe, which combines the two of these in just a second. But, um, but they are different. Oats are so nourishing, like they literally have nutrients in them, um, like especially minerals like calcium. And so they're kind of building in this different way, I think, of giving our body the nutrients it needs to, you know, restore vitality and also 
um, especially for the nervous system, high in magnesium, just really helping to soothe and restore the nervous system. Yes. And I, I feel like the, I think it, I think it was Jim McDonald who I first heard say that I think it's Jim who thinks of oats as being like a universal herb mm-hmm. that, um, whereas, you know, like shatavari, it definitely has, you know, like Rosalie said, you have to be careful with dosage. And um, and like I said, sometimes it can give people breast tenderness and things like that. But milky oat, um, yeah, I think it was Jim who said that, that he, he will put it in all formulas because it is so sort of brilliant, but gentle and general at mm. the same time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would, I would definitely say there's so few contraindications for this plant. I would say the only one is that sometimes people who are sensitive to gluten are a little bit wary of it. And the idea with, there's kind of like two things to think about with that one. Um, one, oats themselves, like what we eat for breakfast, oatmeal, etc. Sometimes those are processed in factories that also process wheat and it gets kind of cross-contaminated because there isn't actually gluten in oats. But that's why you have to buy, if you're celiac or gluten sensitive, you have to buy gluten-free oats. You have to make sure that they were processed in a facility far away from wheat. Milky oats, oat straw, which we should talk about the difference between the two of them, they don't have gluten in them either. They do have like a similar protein that a very small percentage of people might react to. But in general, most people who have a celiac or um, a gluten sensitivity are going to be fine with oats. And they aren't super, you know, they aren't super warming. They aren't super cooling. They are moistening, but not like marshmallow. You know, they're, they're right. pretty like, they're kind of hovering around that neutral stage, which is where we get those, you know, kind of universal plants that they just don't upset one thing or the other. Mm-hmm. So yeah, let's talk about the different kinds. Cause I think the that difference. is something. Yeah. Let's talk about oat straw. Oat straw. Yeah. Oat straw is a mineral rich plant usually used in infusion form because the, or decoction because the the longer steep or boil actually draws out more of the minerals. It's a lovely, sweet, hay-like flavor. Yeah, it's yummy. <laughs> it's so, so delicious. And it, it's funny, it's in, like interesting to think about the, I'm getting into the weeds a little bit, but the combination of oat straw and oat seed is very similar to shatavari. Because <laughs> um, I feel like oat straw over time helps to sort of, build resilience and build energy levels and sort of like the ingesting of those nutrients and the minerals over time it really just helps to strengthen and rebuild yeah which is so important for um like i was saying that soothes the nervous system because we're giving our bodies what it needs also really well known for supporting the musculoskeletal system and helping build strong flexible bones which is interesting with shatavari in that study that i just found um, just like the two of those, because it's like Shatavari is working another way in this particular study with postmenopausal women helping to enhance muscle function. And then we have the beauty of oat straw specifically and that mineral rich quality is helping to build our bones. And yeah, that's lovely, the two of those together. Yeah. And so those are always oat straw. They're always taken dried and yeah, that long infusion it just gives it that really nutrient dense thing and you need to take it for a while it's something you will mm-hmm. take for weeks really and you'll find like over time that it's really supporting you you could you could take it um every day actually i just interviewed someone this podcast isn't shared yet but i just interviewed someone who has drank an oat straw infusion every day for the past 26 years so this is something you can have for a very long time and uh, yeah, I kidded in the podcast. I was like, you're in a very long-term relationship with oats. <laughs> um, so you, there's no like 26 years. 26 years. Yeah. So yeah, it's something you do want to take for a long time and it's wonderfully supporting and nourishing. It's not like that person's still waiting to get the benefits from oats. It's that like that everyday reconnect with oats is helping um, just maintain a wonderful, um, vibrant life. So oat straw, something again, take it for a long time a day. I wouldn't take it like one day and be like, why don't I feel better? (laughs) That does, it doesn't really work like that. Can I just throw out there for people that I probably would, 
You would. Rebecca um, would. <laughs> That's true. Because I am a deeply inconsistent person, which is, I think, part of my, my incre incredulity over a 26 year, um, a 26 year habit. But I, the reason I'm bringing this up is not just to talk about myself, um, but because with regards to the super fun party that Rosalie and I are throwing, that you should all join if you tend to be a person who has a hard time establishing patterns and habits with things, but would really like to be a person who does something regularly, I, I'm not saying 26 years, or <laughs> it could be 26 years if you like, but if you're a person who has a harder time with being consistent with things, this would be a really fun thing for you to jump in because, hi, you have support. <laughs> um, from an inconsistent corner. I have lots of um, hacks. <laughs> I actually, and I kind of want to take that back. I would say like, I wouldn't take no, oat straw infusion one day and expect my bones to be like at their yeah. uh, optimum the next day. But I love to drink oats infusion in the summertime when it's hot and parched. And like, mm -hmm. you bet I feel really good after drinking that. So there's different levels there. But I would say it's one that you're going to benefit from taking long term for those like, longer standing things like building musculoskeletal right. health and i think you will your nervous system will just benefit over and over uh from that daily uh even if it's you know inconsistent it, there's benefits there whereas but it is different than milky oats so milky oats is when the plant grows up and it goes to seed and it's the immature seed and if you grow oats or have farmers in your area you can visit them at that stage and you squeeze the seed and the milk just pops out of it which is a great doctrine of signatures for many reasons that oats are beneficial. But this, the milky oats, what we do is we tincture it when it's in that state. So you wait until there's a milky seed spot, milky seed pods particularly, harvest them right away and tincture them immediately. And that is a different preparation entirely. Alcohol does not extract vitamins and minerals. So we aren't getting this like nourishing from a mineral sense uh, the way we do, we do with the infusion. But there is a wonderful, like soothing nervous system, restorative. So if somebody's like, I'm fried and burnt out and I just overwhelmed right now, like I'm definitely like, I'm not like, okay, we'll take oat straw for four to six weeks and get back to me. <laughs> you'll feel better in a month. You'll feel better in a month. I mean, obviously it's good to start, to start doing that, yeah. but the milky oats tincture is going to be much faster acting and it's going to be much more helpful in the immediate turn. It is an immediate relief thing for me. Like, I, I know that you mentioned earlier that I tend to be very sensitive. So I, you know, I, I know that not everybody is going to share this experience with me, but but some will that like three drops of milky oat tincture can level me out when wow. I am. Um... I'm like 90 to 100 drops of the tincture. <laughs> <laughs> Set me right. <laughs> milky oat looked at me. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but really like but three drops of it, it's, it's, um, for if I'm, if I'm feeling slightly, slightly like this hmm. wobbly, I guess, slightly emotionally wobbly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I do. I want to say this is kind of a tangent, but I want to say that that's a thing though. Like how you're like milky oats looked at me. Um, if we think of like Pavlov's dog, right. And so Pavlov, you know, he rang the bell and then gave the treat and rang the bell, gave the treat. And then he, you know, basically trained uh, the dog to understand that the ringing of the bell resulted in a treat. Herbs can work like that too, to some extent. It's like if when you have that relationship, like let's say that you rely on um, milky oats, for example, and it like it's like you're you're tra and you take it regularly and you're like training your body of like this is how I react with the milky oats, then you can often take less and less and have that same reaction because your mm. body is like. Like, oh, this is what happens when I take that, which I think is a cool thing to recognize because it's not just that like we're taking this like external thing, like an herb, and then like forcing a physiological change on our body. The herbs are interacting and dancing with our body's systems in a way that creates an effect, right? So it's not just like heavy handed approach necessarily. It's this interweaving of different ways of interacting in the world. So that's a thing. It's 100% a thing. It's so beautiful. Yeah. And it's so true. It's just thinking about how we create neural pathways as a result of doing things. And, mm -hmm. and so it makes so much sense. Of course, you can take less and less and still 
have the same effect because the trigger is always going to activate the same neural pathway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about our recipe uh, that we are sharing with our podcast today. Um, This is uh, a Beck's recipe. (laughs) I'll give you credit. Um, Thanks. Yeah. And we're calling it soft and cozy tea. And this is a tea with oat straw, dried oat straw and shatavri root. Uh, as well as marshmallow root, and then something, you know, that to make it taste yummy, which we're suggesting cardamom, but you could do anything you want, any aromatic, mint, ginger, um, et cetera. So this is, you can download your recipe card for this at either using the link in the show notes or herbswithrosaliepodcast.com. And you're basically putting this into, putting all the ingredients into a quart jar, then we're filling that with hot water, letting it sit for about four hours or longer, four to eight hours, and then straining that off. And um, tell me what it's like when you have this tea, Bex. It's it's like that. Um, (laughs) As a person who runs very, very dry, I I think one of the sort of side effects of dryness is that it can make one very anxious without realizing that that's the cause of anxiety, similar to how hunger can make one anxious or makes me anxious. Um, But dryness can make you feel anxious. It's that frazzled feeling, the, the, the fried and frazzled feeling and two sips of this infusion. It's like the whole body just goes, Mm. and relaxes and moisture returns um to eyeballs and sinuses and throat and there's relaxation that happens as a result of all of the moisture returning and it tastes delicious um i tend to just have a big jar of this there and often now especially during the driest seasons when my friends come over they're like can i have some of that marshmallow stuff (laughs) (laughs) and then I make them just sit there at the table and gosh it just it feels so incredible like if you even if you run the tiniest bit dry it will feel like um to use a totally cliche analogy it'll feel like rain in the desert Mm. or rain after a doubt a drought or something like it just it feels incredible to the body I love how you mentioned like the, you know, kind of like hangry, like the, you know, like that feeling you get when you're hungry. Um, now we need a word for like what, like the feelings of anxiety and frazzled that happens with, like, I don't know if it'd be oh. drangry, because it's not necessarily, like, you could be drangry, I guess, like anger re- resulting from dryness. But I think it's more often that like kind of anxiousness and mm-hmm. unsettledness, frazzled. So drazzled. drazzled, if you're feeling drazzled, drazzled. <laughs> I don't know. We're going to have to work on this. Like fun. <laughs> drazzled it sounds like fun. Drazzled sounds like something. When yeah. you're drazzled, <laughs> this is the tea. Yes. So. When the drazzled tea. Yeah. Well, um, do you have anything else to add to milky oats or should we talk about our third? All right. Let's our dive third. into ashwagandha because how could we not Shwaganda. mention ashwagandha? It's already not? been mentioned. It's one of mm-hmm. my personal favorites. And I would say like earlier we were talking about it being fiery in relationship to shatavri, which I would agree with. But ashwagandha isn't necessarily fiery like ginseng. Right. It's uh, right. much more mellow than that. And it's um, also often used for anxiety and overwhelm and feelings of depletion, like all the, like the other two herbs that we shared with. But I think ashwagandha, like one way that makes it a little bit different is that it really helps to restore sleep cycles. And so this is for that person who is tired and anxious, maybe has insomnia or just isn't sleeping really well at night. And that's kind of the root cause of the problem, right? Because there's just really no herb <laughs> that... Um, substitute sleep, right? We need really good sleep in order to feel great. And the great thing about ashwagandha is it's not like a sedative in that it like, it doesn't just knock you out out at night, but it's restoring sleep cycles and just helping your nervous system. And it's super well studied. So we know while it's been adored for thousands of years, again, in Ayurveda and used extensively for all of its many gifts there. Now it's being studied a lot because people are just so in love with it. And we know, so we know specific things like that it uh, is a really wonderful balancer of the endocrine system. It affects the adrenals in a positive way, even affects the thyroid in a positive way. 
So we know that it's doing this like deep vitality restoration um, in many different ways, not just sleep, but also the endocrine system, et cetera. Tell me why you love ashwagandha. The way I often think about the, like the, the energetic pattern mm-hmm. of ashwagandha is like, if you, if you see all of these different um, like patterns or the, the different areas of the body that ashwagandha affects and brings balance to, um, they're like, they, they look like they're completely separate, but then they're all related in some way to the nervous system and the energy reserves of the body and the resilience mm-hmm. of the body overall. And, and I see ashwagandha, it's like if you're listening and not watching me, I'm waving my hands around in a non-specific pattern that is supposed to be painting a picture. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but, um, I, I see the ashwagandha is just going directly to the root of all of these different various systems that are all fluctuating because they don't have an, an anchor or or a grounding because it's that 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 factor that is resilience and capacity and uh, rootedness that is missing, which is what happens the more frazzled and the more exhausted we get. And I will say that as you know coming from a perspective of resilience this is what happens when you um are in a relationship with your life when you perceive so much of your life as either threatening or stressful i think there's a a perception issue here as well um that has to do with the resilience factor but ashwagandha sort of goes directly to the root starts to anchor in the body, which then has the cascade effect on all of these other systems, which just brings balance to all of the places that are fluctuating, which is why that when when the sleep is fluctuating, ashwagandha balances it. And when the thyroid is fluctuating, ashwagandha balances it. And the endocrine system and the adrenals and and the immune system and, and inflammation and all of these other different factors that sort of go go haywire when when there isn't like a steady stream of energy flowing towards them directly. So that's sort of, that's how I view ashwagandha. It's like, Mm -hmm. if if it looks like there is something underneath that is like not fully grounded or anchored, ashwagandha. Mm, I love that. Yeah, because it is like it's one of those plants that's kind of amazing everything it does. Like it's used for improving cognitive function and healthy brain function. It's used for general longevity because it is modulating the immune system. It's modulating inflammation, helping the brain function, um, helping, you know, the endocrine system. Like it's just this like you're describing this wonderful all around restorative, rooty, um, focused Mm -hmm. plant that's just really amazing on so many different levels. I don't know how many years I've been taking ashwagandha. I take it every day. Um, I don't know, maybe for the past five, seven years. I'm not sure. Um, and so, yeah, I take it every day. Sometimes I'll take breaks with it, but just, I don't know. It just kind of seems to come about naturally. And so I'll just take a break for like a week, but then I'm pretty much taking it again. And I'm not taking it because I'm like trying to desperately fix something, but it is, you know, I'm thinking of more of that longevity um, you know, working with a plant long term that's just helping like you would like have carrots frequently or blueberries. <laughs> it's more of that um, and helping in that way. Some people get a little concerned with ashwagandha because it is in the nightshade family. And so people have sensitivities to the nightshade family. And what, what seems to happen is that there is a very small percentage of people who react to nightshades who will react to ashwagandha. But many people who have nightshade sensitivity do not react to ashwagandha. So it's just something like if you have that sensitivity, I would approach it with caution. I wouldn't just suddenly like eat ashwagandha, a plate of ashwagandha for lunch um, or anything like that. You know, take it slow and see how you react. But don't assume that having a nightshade um, sensitivity would mean that you can't have ashwagandha. And dosage wise for this plant, I think you and I are going to have different ideas, which is cool because there's just no one way to work with herbs. Mm -hmm. I truly believe that. I was taught, um, my mentor was, is an Ayurvedic practitioner. So I learned it in that realm. And so I learned to use the powder and use it in pretty substantial doses. Always start low, 
but you could, you know, for somebody who's like really needing restorative properties, they could take 10, 15, even up to 30 grams, although I wouldn't, um, I don't see that often. Um, so that's kind of, I use that in the bigger sense. And I don't really use it as a tincture, but you do, don't you, Rebecca? I do. I really yeah. like it as a tincture, but um, it's, that, it's that disclaimer again, that I am very sensitive. And so it's, I think for people who are also very sensitive to plants, then I I can really get away with quite a, a low dose you're of tincture and notice I'm a very cheap bait. <laughs> <laughs> and I can get away with a low dose of the tincture and I notice a significant difference in my energy levels within a couple of days. Um, but I am, I'm hesitant to throw that out there as a blanket experience because I know that we're all different and I know that the the ways that I react to things, like I said, Milky Oats looked at me and I, I felt something. It's, uh, I, I would never just throw that out there and be like, Milky Oats can look at you and you'll feel something. It's, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we're all it's very good to know the spectrum, way. I think, for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I really I... do love the tincture. Good. I'm, yeah, it's nice to hear that experience because I'm always like, I don't know. I, you know, I don't really use the tincture and I haven't recommended the tincture, but, um, I know that there's no one way of doing herbs and I think it's so important to acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that you have different experience that you get to share with that. I will say a thing I just recently made, I mentioned before, one of my closest friends is an Ayurvedic practitioner. Her name's Anjali Deva. And she just recently mentioned to me that ashwagandha ghee, actually I, I we're, we're talking about ghee I, and she said ashwagandha and shatavari and ghee is really really traditional and so i just made an ashwagandha and shatavari ghee lovely it's astounding um really really delicious very easy to mm -hmm. infuse but has been so delicious on my morning toast mm, i love that uh, yeah it's a favorite mm -hmm. way for sure um yeah. So uh, other things with ashwagandha, I could, you know, it's one of my very favorite herbs, as I said, when I rely on practically every single day. <laughs> and um, it's, there's some cautions with pregnancy. It's not contraindicated with pregnancy, but just some cautions there. So working with a practitioner is a good idea during pregnancy. And in Ayurveda, they definitely have the contra contraindication of not using it with a current like respiratory illness. Uh, which again is just the, often those kinds of contraindications aren't like a hard, fast rule. It's just something to pay attention to. Oftentimes, like when you're sick, you might just like not be like wanting that herb. It, you'll just feel it internally anyway. So I just put those out there as some things to be aware of. Do you have anything else to share about the lovely ashwagandha? All right. Withania somnifera. I should mention that name. Mm -hmm. Withania somnifera, which is cool because the somnifera means sleep and so we yeah, it's right in the name for it. Yes. Yeah. So we are, the week that this podcast publishes is the week of, um, first week of April. And we are running our Building Resilience mini course this week, which we are super excited for. And the the mini course is, uh, there's definitely teas involved and how, you know, having, setting aside that time every day to have a tea of your choosing. And, um, but there's something to, you know, we said, like Rebecca was saying, like starting that habit, um, just taking the time, even if it just lasts for a week. I mean, we're just like really concentrating efforts into this week. And then we have all this um, opportunities for journaling, introspective things that are super short and simple, but transformative. And um, so last time we did this, we called it a challenge. A challenge. Which, d disclaimer, we both tend to be very choleric, fiery, competitive people. So the word challenge, challenge. for both of us <laughs> is, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a good word. Yeah, we were challenging people to have the you know, herbal tea every day. We're very mm -hmm. loose on what the herbal tea is. We said we could even take a tincture and put like some squirts of a tincture and some water. Tea, mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. But it doesn't have to be a challenge. No. No. I really also like the word party because especially the way it's happened in the past, and I'm assuming it will be the same, there's going to be a lot of people there discussing 
their teas, sharing pictures of their teas, um, discussing the journaling exercises, which are so short and and sweet. And it is, I think of it as a party, but if you are not into parties, you could also think of it as a small gathering of like-minded people who like tea. And introverts are even welcome. You don't even have to, <laughs> you don't even have to say anything. <laughs> you can come and observe. That's welcome too. Mm -hmm. So it's really just a wonderful, fun week. It's with community. We've got tea, we've got herbs, we've got introspection. We're watching things kind of go deeper and deeper throughout the week. And yeah, we're super excited for it. And it's only happening for that week. We do it as kind of the sneak peek preview into our full course of building resilience, but it really gives you an idea to just experience what it's like and um, have a good time that's also introspective. Can I say something about the the journaling and the Be my guest? Okay, I am. Oh, you are. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I think that the thing that I love so much about this mini course and building resilience as well is that the like I said earlier, the resilience is really about your relationship to yourself and your life, and so the the questions we ask are like really, 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 really little, little suggestive questions. Like it's not, uh, okay, so now you're going to spend the next 20 minutes journaling about, um, do you like how like, I, I take on my bro persona, my like <laughs> life hack, life hack. So okay, you're gonna spend the next 20 minutes doing, um, it's, they're, they're much more like, little suggestions or think about think about this while you're drinking your tea or notice this while you're drinking your tea or what you know think about these three things and report back if you feel like reporting back they're very very gentle and I just wanted to emphasize the gentleness of all of the things because life is busy and the thought for me personally of a uh, a mini course where I had extensive extensive writing to do to keep up with it might might be a little overwhelming, but this is not. We promise it is not. It's a very very fun fun week, and for those of you who like me have consistency inconsistencies <laughs> it uh, i think it will also be really fun because like i said earlier there is no better support than a fellow inconsistent person to be like oh you missed a day no big deal come back and try it this way so or mm -hmm. if that's ever been a challenge for you before then this might be a really fun way of dipping your toes in and it's one week. Yeah. And there's a certain momentum to it just being that one week and the momentum to having the community support too. So yeah, it's a fun thing just to, to go in on. And I really like the word invitation. Like we're kind of like inviting you to think about a, a certain topic, inviting you. There's like little things you might do. Um, but yeah, it's, it'll be interesting. Um, like it was in the past two times, like we're, if they're small things, but they're potentially transformative, um, they're shifting, you know, it's like paradigm shifting, just seeing things in a different mm -hmm. light. So yeah, we're gonna have so much fun. And you can sign up using the links in the show notes, or just go to herbalminiadventure.com. And you can sign up straight there as well. And yeah, we're just gonna have an awesome week together. It's gonna be amazing. Please come to our party. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be fabulous. So much fun it really is transformative i remember the the first time we did it do you remember that um people requested that we keep it going yeah we <laughs> they were loving yeah. it so much yeah yeah i do remember that <laughs> <laughs> yeah um yeah so yeah it's gonna be a great time and um and rebecca you'll be back in the same time zone as me which will feel better because then i could message you constantly all day it's gonna be great <laughs> <laughs> yeah with that enjoy the rest of your travels thanks for making time for us while you've been away and um yeah we'll see you all in the building resilience mini course can't wait to see you all there and thank you rosalie for having me
such a pleasure. <laughs> As always, thank you so much for being here. Don't forget to head over to the show notes at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com to download your beautifully illustrated recipe card, and you can also get a transcript of this show. There, you'll also be able to sign up for my weekly newsletter, which is the best way to stay in touch with me. You can get more of Rebecca's offerings at wonderbotanica.com. If you'd like more herbal episodes to come your way, then one of the best ways to support this podcast is by subscribing on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. I deeply believe that this world needs more herbalists and plant-centered folks, and I'm so glad that you're here as part of this herbal community. Also, a big round of thanks to the people all over the world who make this podcast happen week to week. Nicole Paul is the project manager who oversees the whole operation from guest outreach to writing show notes to actually uploading each episode and so many other things I don't even know. She really holds this whole thing together. Francesca is our fabulous video and audio editor. She not only makes listening more pleasant, she also adds beauty to the YouTube videos with plant images and video overlays. Tatiana Rusikova is the botanical illustrator who creates gorgeous plant and recipe illustrations for us. I love them. I know that you do too. Christy edits the recipe cards and then Jenny creates them as well as the thumbnail images for YouTube. Michelle is the tech wizard behind the scenes and Karen is our student services coordinator and customer support. For those of you who like to read along, Jennifer is who creates the transcripts each week. Xavier, my handsome French husband, is the cameraman and website IT guy. It takes an herbal village to make it all happen, including you. Okay, you've lasted to the very end of your show, which means you get your very own gold star and this herbal tidbit. We're looking forward to seeing you in the Building Resilience mini course. It's been a couple of years since we've done this and we're so excited for the return of it because it's so much fun as well as being potentially deeply insightful. But you don't have to take our word for it. Here's what folks told us after the last time we hosted the Building Resilience mini course. One person shared, first, I'd like to say that this group and short gathering has reminded me that there is still so much good in this crazy world we live in. Thank you for having me here. The challenge came at the exact time I needed it. Another person shared, my biggest takeaway being content in the knowledge that even though self-care can seem impossible in the midst of struggle and overwhelm, it's actually very simple. I also learned that it feels good to be consistent. And lastly, another one shared, thank you so much for having hosted this. It has been awesome. Your generosity is much appreciated. I've learned more about herbs to make infusions with and took some notes so I don't forget. I love the feeling of camaraderie in this group. The Building Resilience mini course is happening April 4th through April 10th, 2024. We're excited to see you there. You can join us by going to herbalminiadventure.com and signing up. Again, it's free, it's going to be fun, and it's going to be insightful. See you there.